So on these, I just want to save some time. So taking these derivatives is exactly like taking the other ones. You could either go with quotient rule or write it as one over, uh, you know, one over cos h you could rewrite as negative first power and then do a chain rule. So either way, you could take these derivatives by hand. Uh, so I'm just going to write down what they are instead of how to get them. So we're going to get secant hyperbolic secant will be negative secant tangent. So negative hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic tangent. So there is secant and then cosecant. is cosecant cotangent with a negative. All right, so super similar to all the regular trig derivatives. You just get weird negative signs where you didn't have them before, and sometimes you get no negative sign where you had one before. So they're really similar, just off by a negative pretty much. So I'm going to skip the first example in the notes because I think you can do it no problem. So the first example that I'm going to skip is this. Derivative secant of square root x. A little bit of chain rule. That's all you need. So we'll do the second example. can't solve this one. We need integration by parts for that one. How about this one? Cos hx over e to the x. That doesn't look like any of those antiderivatives or derivatives. What do you do when you can't see what to, if, if there's not a good formula right away? You sub. What's a good choice? E to the x. So what is du? e to the x dx. All right. So what is the problem? I could write, if I had e to the x in the numerator, this would be better. But the real problem is there's no e to the x right here. This is just cosine hyperbolic of x. So I don't think u sub is going to save us on this problem. What can we do instead of u sub? So we can use an identity. So I could, now e to the x, there's not really, e to the x, there's not a really good way to write that down with an identity. It's the inverse of the ln function, which is the antiderivative of some stuff. So that, I don't know there's a good way to unwind e to the x. How about the other piece, cos hx? Is there a different way to write that? And it happens to have e to the x inside of it. Oh, that's convenient. So let's rewrite cosine, oh, hyperbolic cosine. Is that the one with the plus or the minus? Plus. The plus? All right. So I'm going to write it as one, uh, e to the negative x times, I just don't want to have a fraction of fractions, so I'm going to take my e to the x in the denominator, bring it to the numerator with a negative power. And then cos h is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2 dx. All right. All right. Is it plus? All right. And now distribute and integrate. So you should be able to do the integral from here. 
it's not terribly tricky at this at this point. And we multiplied e to the x and e to the negative x before. Should be u subbing right now. I'm guessing and checking. So I knew the derivative e to the negative 2x is basically e to the negative 2x. So I knew this function was pretty much its own derivative, but the chain rule was multiplied by some constant. So I just guessed e to the negative 2x took the derivative. The derivative is negative 2 e to the negative 2x. So I basically made it negative divided by 2 to cancel that out. And that's pretty much what your du tells you. Du times negative one half equals dx. That's where your constant comes from. So that's where that negative half comes from. Uh, ch 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 All right. So let's get into inverse hyperbolic trig. Sounds scary. So we'll start with hyperbolic sine inverse, or sine h to the negative 1x. And that is the same thing as we can move hyperbolic sine, sine hx equals y. And this works for all y, no matter what. Uh, the same thing for cos inverse. Is the same thing as regular hyperbolic cosine y equals x, and this is when y is greater than or equal to 0. On the top one, it should be sine h y equals x? It should, yep, it definitely should be. All right, I tried to write them, kept the y's on the left, x's on the right, and then moved the, the function over by writing the inverse. And then tangent. Hyperbolic tangent inverse x is the same as hyperbolic tangent y equals x. And this is all y. All right, so I'm super fast identities now. Hyperbolic secant h inverse x is cos h hyperbolic cosine inverse 1 over x. All right, so I'll show you why this one works out. So why is this one true? This basically looks just like the, if I erase the h, we did the same thing for the regular trig functions. So they're definitely reciprocals. What they reciprocate is the, um, 
not the angle, but the sides, if you think of trig in terms of angles and sides. So where do the sides appear in an inverse trig function? They appear as the input. Regular trig functions eat angles, give you sides. So inverse trig functions eat sides, give you angles. Um, if I write this out, I'll oh, skip writing it out. I want to get make sure we get through all of this. So there's secant, cosecant hyperbolic inverse x is sine hyperbolic inverse 1 over x. If we have time at the end, we'll come back and prove uh, that first one. Cotangent hyperbolic inverse x is tangent hyperbolic inverse 1 over x. All right, let's do a derivative now. All right, you don't really have any way to know the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic trig. So how can you find derivative of an inverse function if you don't know much about the inverse function? It's the first thing I taught you this quarter. That formula. <laughs> 1 over derivative of the function of the inverse function of x, right? Yeah. That one. All right, so what you didn't forget you'll know it as soon as I write it down is that right there. So we've seen that probably 15 times I've written it down approximately. Okay. So the good news is we do know the derivative of hyperbolic cosine, regular hyperbolic cosine. We're going to use that to find the inverse, and then we'll have some nasty algebra at the very end. We'll try to get through that, and we can't really use triangles at the end. So it'll come down to just algebra. So here we go. Derivative is, so our f inverse is cos h inverse regular f is cos h, f prime is regular sine h. h. These are, of course, of x, of x, of x, of x. All right, this is going to be 1 over f prime of f inverse of x, which is 1 over f prime is sine h of f inverse, which is cos h inverse of x. So that wasn't so bad. All I needed was that inverse derivative formula and just that one derivative. Now, how in the world do we simplify this down? That's a good question. All right. One of the ways we did it before is we said let theta equal the inside one right there. So let's just play our old game and see if it works. Theta is not the best letter to use because it makes you think you're really using an angle. I'm just going to use theta not because it's an angle, but because it's what we're familiar with. So I'm going to let theta equal cos h inverse x. It's just a number. So whatever the output of cos h inverse of x is, it's just that number. So cos h theta equals x. What do I want? I want to know. sine h of now theta, sine h of that stuff, which that stuff is theta. So I want sine h of theta. So I have cos h of theta is x. How do I find sine h of theta? So how can I relate sine and cosine together without bringing in anything other, any other thing that's like really bad, like sine of 2 theta or something like that, or sine h of 2 theta. So don't use the double angle formulas. That just brings in more stuff. There's really only one way they're related without bringing in something more complicated. And it's not sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. It's the minus. So that was like one of the first identities. So it's, I think it was cos squared minus sine squared. So we're using 
post h squared theta minus sine h squared theta equals 1. So it's our sort of new Pythagorean identity. Sort of Pythagorean, it's not the actual Pythagorean identity, but it's like the analog in hyperbolics. So I want to know about sine h, so I'm just going to solve for sine h. So we'll add sine h to the other side, subtract 1. So we have cos h squared theta minus 1 equals sine h squared theta, square root both sides. So we got plus or minus square root cos h squared theta minus 1 equals sine h theta. What is cos h theta? x. So I'm going to take out cos, cos h theta is x, so this whole thing is x times x, or x squared. So we got plus or minus square root x squared minus 1 equals sine h theta. Now in my notes it says use the positive of the 2. I think we would need to carefully graph to make this choice. Unfortunately it doesn't come down to things like quadrants and all that stuff. So if we graphed out uh, the original cos h inverse of x, we could look and see that the slope should always be positive. And that's why we're going to pick the, the positive one instead of the negative one. So I don't want to go through that level of detail, so I'm just going to say it's a positive one. You can do the exact same thing with all the other functions. Uh, somewhere I wrote down similar identities for tangent and secant. Up. Dun, dun, dun. Before calculus fun began, here we go. So here's the two tangent, cotangent identities right here. Tangent squared, cotangent squared. So you can use those two plus some algebra to reduce on the last step uh, of all the other derivatives. I am just going to write down the derivatives though. So we'll start by rewriting what we just had. So d dx sine h inverse x equals 1 over square root x. Uh, I'm going to write it as yeah, x squared minus 1. All right, every derivative, you get a free antiderivative. So I'm going to write down the free, yes? Is that your code? Yep, sure is. So that should be a cos inverse. All right. All right, so our free antiderivative, we're going to move the derivative operator to the other side as the inverse derivative. So it will be integral. 1 over square root u squared minus 1 du equals cos h inverse u plus c. So we need a really big box here. We're going to fit six of these rows into this box. So you'll need a lot more vertical space. All right, and this is the same flipping of the derivative to the antiderivative that we've been doing quite a few times. So I'm sort of doing that much faster now because I think we've done that like 20 or 30 times at this point. All right, is that form different than the one from last section? Any, I think it should be different. Do you have the book today? So the book uses A's in there, so let's fill in our, the one that should make it onto your cheat sheet with A's in it. And I'm pretty sure it goes U squared minus A squared. I just want to get the A's right on the right side. So for sure it has this in it. I just don't know if there's an extra 1 over a in front of cos h inverse. I don't think there is, but I want to be correct. Should we at the very last 
page 077 for the exercises. So this is table 7, 10, and 7, 11. Really, table 7, 11 is the one you really need. So in your book, table 7, 11. All right. So I'm just going to copy down the ones from this table and just skip the ones without A's in them. So I'm going to put the A's in them as we go. All right, so sine and cosine inverse don't have A's. So that's, this is what sine, cosine inverse has. So don't put that one in your table. It's a little less useful. Put the one with the A's in there. So sine H inverse X. You get the same thing. It's just X squared plus 1. Writing. So it's integral 1 over u squared plus a squared du equals sine h inverse u over a plus c. This does seem super familiar to one of our other forms. Seems like just sort of sine inverse or cos inverse. Ah, okay. So this is a new form then. Yeah. Okay. So that's a new form. So both of these are new and good. All right. So there's sine. Now we're going to go to tangent. Tangent. So this is 1 over 1 minus x squared. And the antiderivative of 1 over a squared minus u squared du equals hyperbolic tangent inverse inverse u over a Actually, two ways to go on this. And these two have one over A in front. The first one is if U is U squared is less than A squared. And the second one is if U squared is greater than a squared. So this is a step function antiderivative. Of course there's a plus c. So tangent cotangent hyperbolic inverse derivative is 1 over x squared minus, oh, 1 minus x squared? Yeah. Secant and cosecant. Secant hyperbolic inverse derivative is negative 1 over x square root 1 minus x squared. So flipping that around, we get integral. We'll move the negative to the other side on the antiderivative. So it's going to be u square root a squared minus u squared du. 
equals negative secant hyperbolic inverse u over a plus c, and I know there's a 1 over a. So this will be negative 1 over a. Now this only makes sense when a squared minus u squared is positive, so there is a restriction on u and a. There's actually a restriction on all of these. I'll write the restrictions outside. Cos h has an a needs to be greater than zero. No, uh oh, oh. they're a different order in the book. So cos h inverse has u greater than a greater than zero. Sine just has a greater than zero. This next one is u squared less than a squared, and then u squared greater than a squared, zero less than u less than a. And last up is cosecant inverse, hyperbolic. So our derivative is negative one over x square root one plus x squared and there should be an absolute value on this. I won't make a big deal about it on creating midterms and quizzes. Uh, you won't need that. And the antiderivative looks really similar. like u square root a squared plus u squared du equals there's still that negative sign negative 1 over a cosecant hyperbolic inverse x plus c and the restriction you need to have u obviously not 0 or you're going to have problems because you'll divide by 0 and a greater than 0 Oh yeah, that should be a, this one should be a u over a. All right, so what do you need? You really need table 711. So that's inside your book. And it's basically the right, the antiderivative column right here. So we did all this work for this is the important column. Another really good place in your book, there's every, almost every antiderivative you need is in one spot and it's right at the beginning of chapter eight. So it's table eight one on page 435. So it was an almost complete anti D table. There will be a couple homework questions. I think that I may have some other stuff, some of the uh, identities and derivatives from 7-7. Seven, seven. But your midterm is only going to cover the antiderivative forms. All right, so let's do problems. None of my notes, so good thing we have a book.
All right, this one's going to be not so bad. So first of all, what form, it's not quite in the perfect form yet, but what form is this going to be? Should be the hyperbolic sine inverse because it has a, a square root and a plus. So it'll be a cosine. This is what I'm looking at right here. It's a 1 over square root of squared things added together. So that says, ah, it's going to be hyperbolic sine inverse. The problem is, well, 9 is pretty easy to write as 3 squared. So that's super easy. What's the other problem? There's a 4x squared. How do we take care of that? So it's going to be plus 2x whole thing squared right there. Now we're almost ready to go. What is the next step? I haven't done any calculus yet. We're about ready to do calculus. U sub. So u equals 2x. So find du and finish this off right now. I'll give you one minute. There should be plenty of time. questions. All right, not so bad. That should have felt pretty straightforward. All right, next problem. Integral cos x dx divided by square root 1 minus sine squared. Hyperbolic. So we're in hyperbolic, so hopefully, hopefully I wrote it with the form that we have. So it looks like thing squared minus other thing squared, square root. I think that should be up here. Oh no, it's not on here. It's not quite cosine h inverse because cosine h inverse puts the u first before the a. So it's u squared minus a squared. What we have is number squared minus sine squared. However, I think the regular trig will help us out. The regular trig inverse. That right. Somewhere. All right. Yeah. So here's our brain, hopefully. 
as a blob integral du over square root uh, du over square root a squared minus u squared equals sine inverse of u over a plus c. All right, so I can use this form. This is one of the inverses we got from the last section. All right. What u sub should I make? So sine is good because derivative will be cos x dx. Ah, cos x dx is perfect. Du is hanging out right there. Du equals cos x dx. So integral du over square root 1 minus u squared. This is perfectly set up in the form. A is 1, so I don't really need to worry about A. So we get sine inverse parentheses u over 1 plus c equals sine inverse u over 1 u is sine x plus c so how can I reduce this what's sine inverse of sine x oh that's super simple x plus c oh man there's another way to do this what can you do before or after you do calculus? We did it after we did calculus, a little bit of algebra. What if I did my algebra first? What's one minus sine squared? Cosine. What's square root of cosine squared? Cosine, cancels cosine. So this is the integral of one dx. Which you know the antiderivative is x plus c. All right, you can do algebra first or second. It's up to you. It's not always the right answer. <laughs>